My research of the last year has led me to the conclusion that not even low Earth orbit is possible, that the International Space Station is a hoax, and all manned space travel is fake. First, though, let's have a look at the International Space Station. I want to talk about some of the anomalies I see there. For the inside of the International Space Station, there are a couple of zero-gravity tricks that they use to fake it. The first is they have a complete mock-up of the International Space Station built on the inside of an airplane. And that airplane does a bunch of rises and falls. It does a parabolic, upside-down parabolic trajectory, and that simulates zero-gravity. The other main way they simulate the zero-gravity is with suspension in front of a blue screen. And they use that trick for extended periods of time, for longer than 45-second segments. But they can't move around as much. They can't do the acrobatic flips and rolls in the extended mode. So there's full motion mode where they can fully move around, and that's faked in a plane. And then there's suspended or extended mode where they're suspended by wires in front of a blue screen. They don't move around as much, but they can make the scene last for a longer period of time. In this scene, Chris Hadfield bends down in order to adjust something, and you can see on the back of his shirt a couple of upticks on either side where you would expect wires to come in on either side of that harness in order to support it. Of course, they've computer graphicked out the supporting wires. You can't actually see them, but what you can see is a very slight discoloration where it's slightly lighter and then it goes slightly darker. And that's strange. That shows a couple of things. First of all, it shows that this isn't live from space. They're often portraying that this is live. Of course, these things are fully choreographed and edited in advance to make sure that there's nothing too obvious that you can see that gives away that this is a suspension in front of a blue screen hoax. The other thing it shows is that this is not raw footage coming to us. This is edited stuff. This is supposed to be a legitimate space program. This is supposed to be the International Space Station, and we should be able to see whatever's going on. But they edit things, because the whole thing is edited. In one extended mode scene, Chris Hadfield on the right is going back. He's going back, 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 and then he just stops. That's an odd motion. You would expect if this was true zero gravity that you have to support yourself, you have to stop yourself on both the top and the bottom of your body as you're drifting back. If you just stop yourself with your feet, then your head will rotate backwards. Conversely, if you just hang on at the top with your hands, then your feet will still keep moving. You have to support yourself at the, both the top and the bottom of your body. But his hands, Chris Hadfield's hands, aren't touching anything. He just goes back and then he stops. And that's odd. You can see a sort of a harness sticking through the t-shirt of Chris Hadfield. It's a harness that's around the waist. That's how they're supported. Also notice that Chris Hadfield has the habit of bringing his knees up. That's because his stomach muscles aren't as strong. He doesn't have as much midriff strength as some of the others who are able to elongate their body and make the hoax look a bit more realistic. He's constantly bringing his knees up because he's not as strong as the others. Occasionally, though, the others bring their knees up too. Notice that in the extended scenes, which seems to be done in front of a blue screen, like if you have a look at this guy going back towards the screen, there's some strange shadows there, look like they're CGI'd in. Using computer graphics, they edit out the supporting wires and edit in these rotating floating objects. They always seem very concerned with the object. Chris Hadfield looks at it very closely. You don't want the object getting too far out of control because if it starts bouncing off the cabin in a weird way or goes back to the blue screen, it could ruin the whole illusion. They also don't bounce those oranges off the walls. I'd like to see them get a tennis ball and throw it around really hard and fast. And I'd like to see them do -si do each other really quickly, which they can't do, or they'd get all their wires tangled up. The extended mode is much quieter than the full motion mode. In full motion mode, you can actually hear the sound of the jet engines, the engines of the airplane. 
in every single scene of full motion mode, in every segment of the International Space Station, you can hear this loud sound, the sound of jet engines. You could argue that it's the air conditioning Please, system. Not even an office air conditioner is that loud. And why is there a loud sound in every segment of the International Space Station? That's because no matter how soundproof you make it, you can't filter out all of the sound of the jet engines. An airplane is just too noisy. You can put noise cancelling headphones on, on when you're on a plane and that doesn't stop the sound from getting through. It muffles it. They also use microphones that don't pick up very far away. If you have a look at this scene here, you can see that when the microphone's in the middle, pointing towards the guy in the middle, you can't hear the sound of jet engines as much, but when the microphone goes to the guy on the side, you can hear the sound of jet engines a bit more. So you can't truly soundproof the inside of the airplane where they fake full motion mode. See in this scene from the recent National Geographic documentary Life from Space, Koichi Wakata is um, in looking at the window the there. Area this is full motion mode, and you can tell because of the sound of jet engines. In quiet mode, I'm they can go to the copula and they can look through at their model, and you can see an amazing model. Gee, why would you build the International Space Station out of a bunch of long, thin segments that can easily break at the joints? Hmm. So there's their fairly realistic view of the rest of the International Space Station. Hello, Rick. Hello, Dermot. Welcome to the International Space Station. Oh, it's nice to have you with us. Rick, uh, uh, thank you so much. When, um, when, when did you uh, apply to join the astronaut program yourself? Well, actually, uh, you know, getting selected as an astronaut is uh, not as easy as it sounds. Uh, I started applying many years ago, and it actually took me nine years and nine different applications before I was finally selected in three different interviews. Oh, absolutely. It went well beyond any expectations I had. And, uh, and Koichi, you're, you're the commander of the ISS. Congratulations, the first Japanese commander. What, is, what does being commander actually mean? Well, um, uh, it's quite an honor and a big challenge for me, but I am humbled to take up this challenge. I'm so happy to, to be able to work with uh, my uh, very hardworking uh, crewmates, uh, Rick and Misha. And uh, I think I got to see that I have a really talented and motivated crew. Uh, I got the easy part. Uh, just to make sure that they're eating fine and they're sleeping fine and just having fun up here. And I need to make sure that we have good communication with the flight control teams, a wonderful team uh, all over the world. But, uh, you know, we work together as an integrated team, and it's really a lot of fun to work with uh, Rick and Misha. Uh, and what's the reaction been like in Japan? Actually, uh, uh, they really liked watching the uh, change of command ceremony last uh, uh, Sunday. And uh, I had a lot of feedback. And uh, like to uh, many uh, international partners of the International Space Station program, to Japan, it means a lot to have uh, its own representative to have a chance to command the uh, International Space Station. Have a look at their feet. Their stabilization bars, blue stabilization bars. <laughs> Bentley! Oh. 
to balance the rotation. As he moves away from there, he moves forward. And once again, he hangs on to the bar on the side with his left hand to stabilize himself. International Space Station. Hello, Katie. Hello. This is so cool, isn't it? Hey, Katie, well, I want to ask Welcome aboard the space station. This is Leah. Welcome aboard the space station. This is Leah. Look at this. Wow. Are you going to be okay or? <laughs> This is a light too, so we got to sleep out of space. Katie, can you hear me? You know, we, we, yes, I can hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, good. The thing we do, we're weightless, and, and all the things we're doing it with are weightless as well. So you start off with that teeth brushing thing, and I have to say, you know, spitting, that's going to be a problem. So we swallow our toothpaste, and uh, the day goes weightless from there. What is your what is your average work day? Is it like a real eight hour day or? And then what do you guys do? You sit around looking out the windows, or what do you guys do? <laughs> this is what I want to know. That scare you? I won't say they scare me, but I, I'll tell you that I take them uh, very very uh, pers um, seriously. In that we exercise. Um, you know, about almost two hours a day, which I'll say I'm not disciplined enough to do down on the earth, um, but I do it up here because the implications of not exercising are really having a tremendous amount of bone loss, and I have a 10-year-old, and I figure I still have a lot of running around to do when I get home. Katie, I wanted to ask you, other than your family, your son, what do you, as a woman, what do you miss the most? jelly beans, but then how to eat these in space? This is truly challenging because as soon as I open this bag, all of these are going to want to come out. And so I'm going to have to have just a couple come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Japan, and that brings us to Koichi, who's in the Japanese lab Kibo. So Koichi, walk me through what you're working on in this lab. Yeah, this is an experiment called Spheres, uh, and these uh, satellite robots are specifically designed to function in the microgravity. They contain the software that the scientists are testing. At first, this looks like a full motion scene to me, but on closer inspection, I think this is a suspended mode scene. When, the, when it's sped up, you can kind of see them swinging, and it has the same backdrop as the other suspended mode scenes. And then there's this weird part. Rick Mastracchio puts out his hand and he moves forward. Maybe he's using his feet to wedge himself forward somehow, but it doesn't look like it. The floor is smooth. His foot is behind that blue handle that's attached to the floor that he keeps both of his feet under and keeps shuffling back and forth on. He sticks his left hand out and then he just moves forward. He is Superman. That's how Superman moves forward. He sticks out his arm, and he flies. Another aspect of the illusion of space travel is space walks. These are faked inside a swimming pool. It's a custom-built swimming pool, and that's a great way to fake zero gravity. About six months ago, in 2013, a gallon of water leaked into one of their spacesuits in a matter of seconds. NASA doesn't really have a proper explanation for how on earth this could have happened. There shouldn't be water leaking into someone's helmet and a person almost drowning in space. How can you drown in space? They now wear snorkels to make sure that they don't drown in space. How can this be happening? A snorkel in space? 
there could be some water in the poorest place sublimator. When they were on the moon, they supposedly had a, about a gallon of water, but that cooling system is supposed to be well away from their head. There really is no sane explanation for why a gallon of water would leak into someone's spacesuit, unless you realise the whole thing is faked inside a swimming pool. In this scene, you can see the Chinese spacewalk, and you can see a bubble coming up from the guy's suit. How do you have a bubble in space? Space is supposed to be a vacuum, not a swimming pool. But it's obviously just a swimming pool filled with water. Obviously, there would be some equipment that they could only fix from the outside. But a lot of these spacewalks, it seems like equipment they easily could have configured to be accessible from the inside of the International Space Station. It seems more like an excuse to get out and show their other space trick, which is the faking of spacewalks in a swimming pool. In this vid, you catch a glimpse of someone wearing a scuba tank. Scuba tanks in space? Snorkels and scuba tanks in space? They act like a spacewalk is just a walk in the park, like there's very little danger involved at all. They're looking through the spacesuits. Oh, <laughs> here's a spacesuit. We're going to go for a spacewalk. As if there's no danger at all. Like they don't care. They don't care. They, they don't act like they're in a life-threatening situation. Like they could die at any second, even though they can. So you'd think to preserve their life, they would want to minimise the amount of space walking that they did. But there seems to be an abundance of equipment on the outside of the International Space Station that constantly requires repairing, which makes for a good TV spectacle and is inspired by movies like Sandra Bullock's Gravity. And after Gravity came out, they, of course, had to do another spacewalk to fix some emergency some piece of equipment that their lives depend on that, amazingly, they can fix every time. But you know what? Thanks to the genius of the engineers at NASA, they employ snorkels in space now, so that should stop them from drowning. Right, so the, so the snorkel, as I mentioned, this is actually a, a, a part that we can change out on the spacesuit. It's part of a waterline vent tube assembly, which is actually what runs from the, the backpack of the suit, and it's what hooks up to the liquid cooling and ventilation garment that the crew members wear. So normally these tubes will be passing water uh, that's providing cooling around the crew member's body. So some smart engineers on the ground were able to uh, figure out, hey, this looks it's a similar diameter to a snorkel that you have for scuba diving. So what if we're able to, each waterline vent tube assembly has two of these tubes. So by just sacrificing one of our, our spares on board, they were able to come up with a way to to just snip off the ends and then file it so that it's not rough in the crew member's mouth and then apply Velcro. We already have Velcro inside the suit, which is what holds the drink bag up to the front part of the suit. So they were able to come up with this ingenious idea to, to hold it in. I guess uh, the, the unique experience is a really way, good way to describe it. Uh, you know, there's one aspect, the, uh, the part of being outside that uh, is really similar to being in the NBL, the uh, training facility, the neutral buoyancy lab, the big swimming pool we have at uh, Johnson Space Center down in Houston. Um, everything looks the same in that uh, swimming pool, but outside, you know, there's a, a big earth going by, there's uh, sunsets and sunrises to, to kind of wake you up or brighten, kind of blind your eyesight, and so just the, the view is what's uh, completely different. That's what uh, takes your breath away when you're uh, trying to get back to the business of uh, doing your work, and amazingly enough, the Earth is just uh, rotating by underneath you. And, uh, you know, we talk about spacewalks, but it's a bit of a misnomer. It's more like a space floating. You're really not out there walking. And I guess uh, the best analogy I can uh, tell everybody is if you could imagine yourself scuba diving in a suit of armor, that's about what spacewalking is like. And the wide field planetary camera two is clear of the structure of the telescope. And now uh, Foista will be maneuvered uh, by Mick. It's a Chinese spacewalk. A bubble rises in the pool. It's complete fraud. Here the helmet gets hit on the International Space Station. And a bubble rises <laughs> into the pool. This uh, spacewalk from NASA isn't even a month old yet. And here's a bubble taking an odd trajectory because it's in a water pool. It even curves because the water is uh, 
It's not motionless, it's moving. And uh, here on the International Space Station, they once even got caught with a scuba tank in space. It's ridiculous that they get away with this shit. Lots of things could go wrong. They're on the edge of death every second, yet they act like giddy children with gay abandon. Another curious thing is, take this piece of exercise equipment. They've deliberately detached it from the wall so that it's not directly attached to the side of the International Space Station, so that when they exercise, when they do their movements, the movements don't translate to the station and don't move the station around. That's a wonderful concept. I like that idea. You wouldn't want the station to be moving around a lot. The problem is, this piece of equipment is the only thing that they isolate from the International Space Station. Every other movement is translated to the station. They don't care. They don't bother to isolate the station from the people moving around inside. They grab these blue handles, which are all over the station. They often have to stabilize themselves on these blue handles. There seems to be so much motion in the International Space Station. If you take Chris Hadfield, he's moving through the station at breakneck speed, and then he stops himself on the wall. That motion is going to be translated to the station. The station is very big, it weighs many tons, but in space there's really nothing to stop these motions from moving the position or the orientation of the space station. The International Space Station uses several large gyroscopes for attitude control to maintain its proper orientation and so on. And there's a reaction control system consisting of rockets as backup, supposedly. We can only presume that the rocket-based reaction control system isn't employed very often as they don't talk about it. Given that there are so many people inside moving around, moving gear around all the time, and every time the solar panels were moved, every time the Soyuz docked with it, there would be motions impinging on the station, and this would move the station. So what you'd need is a system of rockets on the outside, burning fuel, in order to stop the International Space Station from misaligning, from moving out of place. When it comes to satellites and things in orbit, you don't want them moving around a lot. The International Space Station changes in altitude somewhat, supposedly. It goes up and down. They supposedly bring up three tons of water every year. That's hard to believe, but let's take that at face value. But they never talk about huge amounts of rocket fuel. But even without the rockets, all of these motions of the astronauts and the solar panels moving around would put tremendous strains on the joints. And they're not flexible joints. Having a huge airproof flexible joint of that size would be an incredible engineering feat. They don't have them anyway. There's not supposed to be any relative motion between sections. The International Space Station was made piecemeal. They started off with one section and then they added another section, another section. It consists of a bunch of tubular sections which are joined together. It's an ad hoc design. Here are a few scenes from the tour of the International Space Station that they take you on. And I notice that there's no airlock between sections. This means if there's an air leak in one section, they will be affected in all sections. They're quite likely to all die. You could wear the spacesuit, that would work for a few hours until you had to eat, and then you'd have to take the spacesuit off and you'd be exposed to the vacuum of space and you'd be dead. The porous plate sublimator only lasts for a few hours anyway. Sometimes they're tethered. Do they have tether points on the inside of the International Space Station? Not likely. They don't really design it with life in mind. You could argue that they all scramble into the Soyuz and try and get back to Earth in the event of an air leak. Well, that would be very odd. They would have to completely change and recalibrate, recalculate all of the re-entry parameters, if you're going to cram all 11 people or however many people they have on there, they have many people on the station at the same time. You also couldn't cram that many people, all 10 or 11 of them, into 
the one Soyuz at the same time. They only ever have one emergency Soyuz escape capsule. You couldn't cram them all in. It's very odd that they're up there in this life-threatening situation where an air leak could happen at any time and they could all die, and there's not even enough lifeboats for them to make it back to Earth. Having no airlock in between sections is very odd. The more sections they add to the International Space Station, the more dangerous it becomes, and yet they don't care. Another curious aspect is how they deal with water. There's no proper shower, so they must be incredibly uncomfortable and stinky the whole time, yet they have huge smiles plastered on their face. They can't have a proper shower. Nevertheless, they must use some water in order to clean themselves, in order to clean their hair. What do they do with this water? Supposedly they have suction for when they urinate, but aside from that, there are no special vacuum sinks. In other words, there's water floating around all over the International Space Station. Now, none of the surfaces are waterproof. It's just expected that you keep the water confined to one area of the International Space Station away from the delicate electronic equipment and so on. And what do you do with this water, especially dirty water? Because that's what water does. It absorbs dirt and particles. They would accumulate so much filthy water. The mantra, of course, is recycling. They're supposed to recycle everything. Wow, they have some amazing recycling technologies on the International Space Station that they can't demonstrate anywhere else. I mean... It's a super water recycler that's compact enough to fit inside the International Space Station. Imagine how much maintenance such a system would require. You'd have to bring up so many filters and chemicals and things would be breaking down and you'd have to repair it, but you don't have the tools to do it. So there's another curious, strange aspect of the International Space Station which endangers their lives and could kill them. But they don't care. They always have huge smiles on their face like they're having a really good time, even though they could die at any second. Another curious aspect is that humans emit dust with time. Their skin dies and drops off. That's what makes for most dust inside a person's house. There'd be so much dust building up on the International Space Station, and yet you never see them go around with a dust buster, with a small vacuum cleaner sucking things up. What do they do with the dust? Well, supposedly there's a trash disposal thing in the form of a re-entry vehicle which strangely burns up on re-entry even though the ones with humans inside supposedly survive re-entry. That's a very curious contradiction. But they have a trash disposal capsule that they put their trash into but they never talk about the dust. They never talk about the solid waste from the supposed space age sewage system that they have. That's another strange thing is supposedly they have a sewage system. I don't know how they cram it into the International Space Station. Perhaps it's in the walls of the station, but they never talk about the smell. It would be impossible to avoid the smell of a sewage system in the walls of the International Space Station because they're trapped inside this tin can. It's completely sealed from the vacuum of space. You could have any number of super filters and try and get rid of the smell. It wouldn't work. They never talk about bringing bacteria up in order to replenish the bacteria that's, that's in the sewage system. They never talk about bringing all of the extra oxygen up that you'd need to let the bacteria process the sewage. In fact, what they must do is simply store their feces in the cupboard. They would have to put on a pair of plastic gloves and grab their feces and put it in the closet. There's no sewage system on there. They can pretend that there's a sewage system. There's no sewage system. So in other words, they're living with their own feces and the smell must be incredible. Yet they always have huge smiles plastered on their face like the International Space Station is the best place in the world to be. But it would be awful. What about their laundry? Well, Chris Hadfield admits there's too much water taken for laundry. They don't do laundry. They just throw their clothes in the trash when they're done with them. 
laundry piles up. Is there a way to clean <laughs> clothes and space? No. Uh, it, it takes a lot of water, of course. A washing machine and a dryer, we don't have anything like that. So we just... Uh, we just wear our clothes till they wear out, and then you throw them in the trash, and the trash is like a little unmanned resupply ship. And when it gets full of trash, then we close the hatch, and it undocks and backs away and, uh, and falls down into the atmosphere. So your dirty laundry actually gets incinerated in the atmosphere. And, and so Wait a minute. You're kid you guys on the space station are throwing your underwear? <laughs> Out your dirty underwear out the window and it's raining down on us? So. so take this woman, Sunita Williams, has supposedly been on the station for 200 days. She's never had a proper shower in that time. She's never laundered her clothes. She just wears her clothes for, I don't know, a couple of weeks a month and then throws them out. In other words, she stinks. She's horrible. She's clammy. She's disgusting. Living on the Internet Space Station, you might be six months without a real shower. Essentially, you have a, a, a sponge bath is what you do every day. And yeah, you do get pretty sweaty because you're working out. But surprisingly enough, um, when the shuttle crew came to pick me up, was one of my first questions, do I smell? And they said I didn't smell, and they said my hair didn't look greasy, so I was, uh, I was pretty happy with that. And yet they all act like they're so happy to be on the International Space Station. It seems mandatory to smile if you're on the International Space Station. I guess when you're doing a hoax, you have to have a big smile plastered on your face, because that's what distracts people. Now check this video out. The whole video is about a minute long. I said 45 seconds before was the maximum for full motion mode. It may be more like a minute that they can do this full motion zero gravity mode. Because then the airplane finishes its parabolic trajectory. It has to dip down for a short period of time. There's double the gravity. Anyway, have a look at the end of this. And there's a strange motion to the Santa. Take a look at the way it moves. It kind of skips out of control, out of her control a couple of times. First it dips down and then up a little bit, and then at the end it goes up a little bit, and she kind of looks a bit embarrassed, like she's been caught putting her hands in the cookie jar. Oops, I hope you didn't see that. No, we didn't see, Katie. Just keep the beautiful smile on your face, and that'll distract us from the hoax. They supposedly urinate into these funnels. How do they keep it clean? How do they stop it from being encrusted with dried urine? You can't use water to clean it. You could, but you'd be wasting a precious resource, and then there'd be dirty urine-filled water floating around the cabin instead of ordinary water. So to summarise, they're living with their own excrement, their faeces and their urine. They build the International Space Station out of long, thin segments, there's all kinds of motions being translated to the International Space Station through these blue handles everywhere. They could spring a leak between segments easily. There's no airlock between segments. They don't do laundry or have showers, and they're incredibly uncomfortable the whole time. They don't have access to proper medical treatment or facilities. They have to routinely go outside to fix equipment because they like to put stuff on the outside of the International Space Station that can only be fixed from the outside. So in short, this International Space Station is a suicidal hellhole. It's an awful place to visit. Every second their life is in danger and they could easily die, yet nothing ever goes wrong that they can't easily cope with and fix given the incredibly limited set of tools they must have up there. And they act like they don't care. The International Space Station is the worst place in the world to be and yet they act like it's the best place you could be.
take your shit. Yeah, you're still in space. Great clip. And uh, the thing that we see and notice the most is planet Earth. Uh, some of our best windows face the Earth, and it's uh, very uh, blue. Hey, look, this pet is floating. How crazy is that? Oops. I realize you just laid your ass on the white and your mom. You don't have to shout, Raj. It's not like I'm an astronaut floating around in outer space. So wait, I am. <laughs> oh, is it everything you hoped it would be? It's better. <laughs> I wake up every morning and I just can't believe I'm on this incredible adventure. <laughs> well, most fun is actually waking up every single morning and realizing that I am still here on the space station. I mean, I grew up as a scientist, and then I was really excited about trying to be an astronaut, became an astronaut, but still, part of you just doesn't believe that you'd really get to live in space. Weightless. Free orbit. Just where are we? You mean this thing is waking? We're, 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 no, sir, not me, me. Nobody ever told me this was practical. Toying this thing around you here, around you here. Take me back. I ain't, I ain't going. That's just to look at. Look at. I'm sick. Take one of these pills. It'll settle your stomach. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, no, Will Robinson. Danger.